you know that there's a good reason to donate blood? Because it saves lives, right? Hi, I'm Dr. Mary Townsend, and I'm a pathologist and a specialist in blood banking, which simply means that blood is my thing. Now you're probably watching this video because you've been thinking about donating blood. But let's face it, if you've never donated blood before, you're probably a little bit anxious. After all, we're all anxious the first time we try something new because we don't know what to expect. So, to make your donation as safe and pleasant as possible, we're going to take a few minutes to tell you exactly what to expect from blood donation. Plus, we're going to give you some tips that put you in control of making your donation an enjoyable experience. A great donation experience actually begins the night before you donate as you prepare your body to lose a unit of blood. The essentials are to eat, drink, and sleep. The night before you donate, get a great night's sleep, and for you night owls, that means at least eight hours. Be sure to eat regular meals, starting with dinner the night before, and breakfast and lunch on the day of donation. Above all, don't ever donate blood on an empty stomach. Lastly, and most importantly, drink lots of fluids. Water, fruit juices, even soft drinks are okay. First, you'll need to present proof of age with a photo ID. Then you'll be instructed to read a brief information sheet about donating blood. Don't rush over this sheet since it contains important information to keep you safe and the recipient of your blood safe. Next, we need to obtain some basic demographic and health information. You'll be asked to answer a confidential health history questionnaire. Finally, we'll check your temperature, blood pressure, and heart rate and stick your finger to test your iron levels. Why do they have to stick my finger and get blood when they're about to draw a whole bag full? Wait, I have to give blood to... What? Huh? <laughs> I have to give blood to give blood? Really? Is this a test? The finger stick is just a way to get a few drops of blood to run through an analyzer to see if you have a high enough iron or hemoglobin count to spare a unit of blood. Don't panic if they tell you your counts aren't high enough to donate. It does not mean you're anemic, but simply that your counts aren't high enough to spare a unit this time. Try loading up on protein-rich food and coming back to the next blood drive to see if you qualify then. Once you've passed the health history, you'll be directed to our hydration station. You should have already begun hydrating the night before the blood drive. However, it is important to drink water just before your donation. What's with all the water? The fluids you drink the night and morning before the blood drive help assure that you don't try to donate blood while you're dehydrated. The water you drink right before donating acts in a different way. The fluid enters your stomach, expanding the muscular stomach wall and sending a nerve signal to increase your blood pressure. This keeps blood flowing to those essential organs like your heart and brain. This nifty trick helps keep you from passing out. That's a lot of water. I hope we get a potty break. Drinking water right before donating is a nifty trick to keep you from passing out. As an added precaution, you may want to eat a salty snack just prior to or even during donation. Why do I have to eat salty snacks? Because salt stimulates hormones that increase your blood volume and help prevent fainting. I love salty snacks. Me too. I could use some water. Me too. Really? You're almost done. Now for the actual blood donation. You'll be directed to recline in a donor chair near other donors. You'll be asked a few questions and to extend your arm. Your arm will be scrubbed for a few minutes to remove harmful bacteria before the needle goes in. Speaking of needles, sorry, but this does involve a needle, and yes, I admit, it looks like a pretty big needle. But if we used a smaller needle, the red blood cells could actually be torn up as they go from your vein into the needle and then into the bag. When it's inserted, you may feel a brief sting at first. Some people do okay if they watch the needle enter the skin, but others do better if they turn away for that part. It's up to you how you think you will react. 
Once the needle is in place, it usually takes less than 10 minutes to draw a unit of blood. Using applied muscle tension exercises during the donation portion has been proven to reduce fainting reactions, and it is yet another way that you can help prevent a reaction. What is this applied muscle tension? It's simple. You just flex your muscles while you're donating. <gasps> Incredible. I don't know about this applied muscle tension. It seems a little embarrassing. I'm not embarrassed. <laughs> Actually, no one will even know that you're doing it. Applied muscle tension is simply tightening and relaxing a certain set of muscles for a few seconds. In fact, this technique was developed to help keep fighter pilots from passing out after sitting in one position for such a long time. For such a simple technique, it can make a big difference in your blood donation. As you're reclining on the donor chair, you simply tighten or flex the muscles of one part of your body while silently counting to five, then relaxing those muscles while again counting to five. Flexing your muscles squeezes on the veins, pushing blood from your lower extremities back to your heart, maintaining your blood pressure, and keeping you from feeling lightheaded or even from passing out. The muscles you want to use are the large muscles, like your calf, thighs, and abdomen, which are usually concealed under your clothing anyway, so no one will be able to see it. Just think of it as a way to work on your six pack while saving a life. However, if you do start to feel weak or lightheaded, please let someone know immediately. They can lower the upper part of your donor chair or raise your legs, which will help bring blood back from your lower extremities to your heart and brain. Whatever you do, please don't wait to tell someone if you're feeling bad. The earlier you let us know, the sooner we can take action and the quicker you'll start feeling better. You did it. The unit of blood has been drawn and now the needle will be removed from your arm and a bandage applied. Now you can get up from the donor chair. But wait, don't be in such a hurry. Start slowly by first sitting up and dangling your feet over the side of the chair. Sitting with your feet over the edge of the donor chair for a minute or so before standing will help prevent a reaction as well. But I feel good. Can I just get up? Sure, you can hop right up if you want to pass out. To keep this from happening, when you sit up in the donor chair, simply pause a minute. This allows your blood pressure to stabilize and prevents you from feeling lightheaded. Then you can stand up and head over to the refreshment area. Grab another beverage and a snack and have a seat on the gym mats. We need you to hang out about 15 minutes before you leave. The 15 minutes is important since 61% of reactions occur at the refreshment area. By staying a full 15 minutes, your body has time to adjust and begin replenishing the fluids you have lost. If gym mats are not available, make sure that you sit at a table with your elbows on the table. We know that your mother worked hard to teach you to keep them off the table, but we think she'll understand this time. Using gym mats or sitting with your elbows on the table is for your protection. If you get faint and fall, you'll slump over onto the soft gym mats or if sitting at a table, you'll slump onto the table rather than taking a dive out of your chair onto the floor. If you use all these precautions, you can head back to that physics class that you so reluctantly missed. But remember, you still need to take care of yourself. Although uncommon, a few reactions can occur after leaving the donation site, usually within the first hour. So you should know how to recognize a reaction and act quickly to prevent an injury. If you feel warm or dizzy, be sure you sit down immediately on the floor. If you delay, you could pass out and hit the floor. If you're driving, pull over immediately, turn off the car, and call someone for help. Let's review the small measures you can take to make a big difference. The night before you donate, eat, sleep, and drink. Eat a good dinner. Get eight hours of sleep. Drink lots of fluids. Right before you donate, drink water to prevent lightheadedness. Eat salty snacks right before and during your donation. Use the applied muscle tension during your donation to maintain good blood pressure. Once your donation is complete, pause a minute with your feet over the edge of the donor chair before you get up. Grab another drink and snack. Rest 15 minutes before you leave. Remember, sit on the gym mats. Or with your elbows on the table. Do I smile? <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, you're all done. 
you followed all the steps, you had a successful donation experience, and you're ready to go back to class. But wouldn't you like to know what happens to your unit of blood on its way to saving lives? With life-saving blood products in constant demand, your precious gift can be on its way to saving life in less than 48 hours after your collection. During your actual blood donation, your blood will initially go into a small pouch before it is then redirected into the collection bag. The blood in this pouch will be used to fill sample tubes, which are sent off for testing to make sure your blood is safe for patients to receive. Over a dozen tests are performed on your blood, including tests for infectious diseases like HIV, hepatitis, and West Nile virus, just to name a few, as well as tests to determine your blood type. While the testing is being performed, your unit of blood will be processed into various components. First, we place your unit of whole blood into an industrial-sized refrigerated centrifuge, which will spin it into its various components, red cells, platelets, and plasma. The separated unit is carefully placed on a spring-loaded compression device. As the unit of blood is compressed, the individual components rise to the top and are transferred into satellite bags for storage. Those components include red blood cells. Red blood cells are stored in a refrigerator for up to 42 days. Red cells deliver oxygen to the body and are needed to replenish blood loss during surgery, accidents, internal injuries, or various diseases. A second component is plasma. Plasma must be stored in a freezer where it's good for up to one year. Plasma provides clotting factors and other nutrients and is used to treat patients with burns, for surgeries and obstetric emergencies, in trauma, and in cancer patients. Another component is platelets. Platelets are more fragile than either the red cells or plasma, so they must be stored under very special conditions, and even then, they're only good for five short days. To keep them viable, they must be kept in a large incubator at room temperature, keeping them constantly moving. This allows gas exchange through the special plastic storage bag. Like plasma, platelets are also needed for blood clotting, so they're used to stop bleeding in surgery and trauma, and for cancer patients undergoing chemotherapy or stem cell transplantation. Finally, your blood will be loaded into a temperature-controlled transport container and delivered to a hospital, where it is first cross-matched and then delivered to the bedside, where it will be infused into a patient waiting for a life-saving transfusion. Blood saved my life. Blood saved my life. Thanks for donating blood. It saved Jake's life. Give blood. It's easy. It's safe. It saves lives. It saved my mom. Life. Live it and give it.